The following transmission is a conversation between myself and a Fallout 76 player named Cazador, who, during his years in Appalachia, amassed over 2,000 confirmed player kills. Cazador engaged in competitive combat with other players in-game at specific PvP encounter areas, wherein he would utilize his knowledge of the game's mechanics, PvP experience, as well as a unique character build to effectively become unkillable by most legitimate means. Utilizing his skills and knowledge, Kazdor quickly became infamous in certain circles of the Fallout 76 player base, using both traits for both good and evil, and earning himself an almost legendary status. During our conversation, we talk about griefing, player engagement, and the situation that led to his eventual banishment from the game. At one point, Kazdor remarks that one of his biggest regrets around his banishment was the in-game friendships that he had made during his time playing it being lost. If you or someone you know was friends with Cazador during his time in Fallout 76, feel free to DM me on Twitter, at FollowerToshi, should you wish to establish contact once again. This transmission is the first in a series of podcast-style recordings that I have wanted to make for quite a while now, sitting down and chatting with different noteworthy members of the Fallout community, and listening to their thoughts and opinions on various different elements of our community, Bethesda Game Studios as a company, and gaming as a whole. Ever since I was young, I've always had an inquisitive mind, seeking to make the most sense of the world around me. As I've grown older, becoming more interested in storytelling, writing, movies, and later politics, my inquisitiveness has only grown, especially as the world and the people around me become more and more dynamic and perplexing. This speculative mindset has only grown since I started doing YouTube, and I have met and interacted with a wide range of different people. And while not always perfect, I've always tried to approach others with a degree of understanding and accountability. I am not sure how my community will respond to a video like this, and I am not sure how the larger Fallout and gaming community will either. Though I will always strive to produce content that I feel to be engaging, entertaining, and insightful. The three E's, if you're bad at spelling like I am. This is the Atom Cast, and the best way you can help it grow is by becoming a Patreon member. Links to that and other socials in the description below. And now, here's my conversation with the Spectre of Appalachia, Casador. Okay, um, so I guess the best place to start off would be more so, you know, learning a little bit about you specifically, um... Obviously, feel free to answer in however level of vagueness you would like. Uh, but tell tell us a little bit about you uh, as as an individual. Sure. Uh, so, howdy, folks. <clears throat> so, my name is Patrick. Uh, some of you may have ran into me if you were fortunate enough uh, to go by the call sign Casador. Um, Obviously, those who are big Fallout fans would get the reference from the absolute menaces of the Mojave uh, that were the Cazador little assholes. Um, I really have kind of uh, became popular, uh, notorious, if you will, um, just from my time playing Fallout 76 um, and the engagement with the community, if you will, that I've uh, had the pleasure of taking place with. Could you describe in a sense specific, like you say, engagement, what, uh, what specifically do you mean by engagement? How did you engage with the community rather? Sure. Well, you know, um, originally when I first started playing fallout, uh, I, which I wasn't, which, which fallout some people Ooh, are going to question. Yeah. Some people are yeah. going to drive me up a wall on that question. <laughs> which one was it? Was it New yeah. Vegas? <laughs> so interestingly, uh, kind of backtracking a little bit is I first got uh, acquainted with the fallout universe with fallout three back in the day. And I, when I uh, was recommended that game from through some friends at school back in way back when I did had no idea what that game was um, in any way, shape or form. And uh, very few times in my life have I been like completely blind to something cool going into it. You know, you know, normally like you're like pumped about this, you're pumped about that. Um, but Going into it completely blind, like Fallout 3 was an amazing experience. 
Um, I also had the pleasure, side note, I also had the pleasure of having that same kind of experience watching The Dark Knight. I was uh, drunk with some friends, and I didn't know what movie we were even going to see. So, like, I didn't know it was a Batman movie until, like, dude dropped down on top of the car and, like, started beating people's faces in. <laughs> I about shit my pants. I'm like, oh, it's Batman. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> um, back on track, though. So, uh, played Fallout 3, played New Vegas. Um, and, you know, I know a, a little bit about the previous installments um, just from wanting to learn about the lore and things. Um, but really what I said, uh, I guess the reason why you're talking to me today is, uh, just because of my interactions on fallout 76. Um, I started playing that game, you know, long after the initial release of that game, because I, I never had the pleasure of playing that on release. I heard it was a hot mess for a lot of people. Uh, but so I played it like maybe a year or two after the initial release and uh, I, I enjoyed it. And it really, it started out just like me, you know, just adventuring, meeting people and really uh, enjoying uh, a lot of like their uh, custom bases and stuff like that. I always thought that was like a pretty cool component of the game. But um, one base really stood out to me and uh, it was like an armory. Like, someone had made, like, a gun store. And, like, I uh, am a big fan of, like, firearms and things like that in real life. So, like, well, seeing that, I'm like, wow, like, this is this is really neat. And I was, like, a low-level player at the time. And, like, the dude was like, hey, like, if you bring me materials and caps, I'll actually uh, craft, you know, better weapons for you so that you can use them, this, that, and the other. Because I didn't have all of, like, the uh, skill perks and stuff that, like, go in with all that. So, like, that was, like, a huge advantage for me. And I was, like, oh, I was all about it. And I'm, like, dude, that kind of interaction was so cool. And, I, and of the screenshots that I still have from that game, that was, like, one of the the few that I still keep. Um, it's just, like, looking at his shop. Because it looks kind of, like, really started a lot of that, like, player engagement. Uh, so then I, I went on to kind of, like, make that for myself. And uh, almost like a, a superhero or maybe, like, a, a villain origin story is I was hanging out um, up north in on the map in that game, and there's a place, a workshop, for those of your fans um, who are familiar with Fallout 76, um, and those who aren't, workshops basically are these points of interest on the map that allows you to claim uh, resources. Um, you, you create stuff that you normally just can't do in your own uh, shops and stuff like that. Um, but they're also places where P, uh, player versus player interactions, like fights amongst each other, can take place uh, without a previous handshake. Normally in that game, uh, someone has to initiate combat, the other person agrees to combat, they both attack each other, and then that handshake, if you will, is like completed, and then they're both allowed to fight. In those areas, if you've claimed a workshop, someone can come through and contest it, and then you're immediately plunged into combat. Um, and I had never experienced that in that game before, and I remember I had a, a pretty high-level like shotgun build that I was like really happy about, and uh, it did really great versus like uh, PVE elements, uh, you know, against like the environment and things like that. And then I remember getting ragdolled by this guy in PvP combat, and I remember. Um, I had good equipment, like for uh, PVE purposes. I had pretty good equipment, <laughs> and I got ragdolled by this guy. And I told myself, I'm never letting that happen again. When you say, um, like you had good equipment, what uh, what kind of equipment are we talking about? So it was, um, if you remember that. that yeah, is, man. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I do. It was. Uh, it was actually an explosive shotgun mm -hmm. um and the cool thing about that is uh when you have an explosive shotgun it does like a tremendous amount of damage to um pve elements like mm -hmm. to monsters and things like that and uh it's it's easy to use the the explosive aspect of it makes it so like the projectiles travel like oh a damn near infinite direction um, so it's not like you don't have like as low a range as you would with um, 
uh, the shotgun, like, you know, comparable to like a sniper rifle or something like that. But with the explosive element, then it, you can use it as like a sniper rifle. Um, so like in VATS, you could uh, aim very, very large distances using that. And what I found out, uh, and unbeknownst to me at the time, is, you know, an explosive shotgun isn't necessarily a bad weapon to use in PvP. But at the time, the, there was a bug with PvP that you could not VATS somebody uh, with a non-hit scan weapon in PvP. So how that would work is unless you use like a railway rifle, um, the cryolator with like the snowball modification, um, there was the harpoon gun and these all have projectiles that are actually traveling through the air per se all those were weapons uh including the crossbow would work in pvp with vats but everything else would not Hmm. um so then unbeknownst to me i'm you know locking onto the student vats uh and i'm i'm taking shots with the shotgun and it's not doing anything to him and i'm just getting manhandled uh getting absolutely murdered and, uh, you know, so that really began my plunge into trying to figure out what would be a effective means to protect myself and my friends. Because I had I had a friend group um, that, you know, we all played and stuff. And um, the idea of us being at the mercy of someone, you know, in, in, you know, our game, you know, or, or the whole group just being at the mercy of, like, one person who's just, like, uh, preying on us. I, that just didn't sit well with me. So from, like, that point forward, I kind of made it a point to kind of be, like, the enforcer of our friend group. Um, and it kind of just started from there. Uh, it went from being more of, like, the enforcer to being more of, like, uh, I, I would describe myself as, like, a high-end player versus player um, competitor in Fallout 76, even though it's not a PvP game. <laughs> um, I would kind of force that upon people one way or the other. Um, so it's, it kind of really just spiraled from there. It's so interesting. Um, well, so like, first of all, um, you, you, you talked about, you talked a lot about, uh, the, the buildup, um, but the actual like interaction with the community, like how, how, like, after that point, you know, you said you 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 wanted to take on an enforcer kind of role, um, and it, it kind of became. It sounds like it kind of became a hunter versus, or uh, the hunter become or the hunted becomes the hunter kind of situation. How like after that point, what was your style of engagement with other uh, with other players in in the community? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, it started, like I said, it started off as, uh, you know, I don't want to say innocent, but like it started off as like, you know, wanting to defend the friend group. Um, and as I played more and more, I, I, I had gotten to like the end game of Fallout 76 as far as like, I've done all the missions. I've I've hit like the level cap. There's not a whole lot else to do. And at the time uh, in that game, there wasn't the um, you forgive me if I if I don't remember what they're called. But basically, as you continue to level up, like it's almost like Paragon points and like in Diablo. Whereas like as you continue to level up, you gain access to like legend. I think it was legendary uh, uh, yeah, perk yeah. cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what they're called. So that wasn't a thing yet. So there, there was really nothing to strive for. There was really not a whole lot to do. So um, just taking on fights in uh, different workshops with people became very entertaining. Mm-hmm. And it, very quickly did I realize that I was like very good at it. Um, I, I would say like in a matter of maybe a week or two weeks, I realized that like, this is very entertaining and I'm really enjoying myself. Um, and then it just kind of turned into, uh, almost like in the same way that a lot of people will role play different aspects. Like you like said, like we had somebody who was like role playing as like a gunsmith gun trader. Mm-hmm. Um, I just kind of started like role playing as like this, um, Almost I'm trying to think of a word to describe it. Not quite a hunter. 
um, <sighs> without being like too serious of my own self, almost like a specter that would like wander the map of Appalachia mm-hmm. and just absolutely wreak havoc. Um, but at the same time, and like this is like the biggest thing that like so many people didn't take away, and then the people who did end up becoming like my good friends. Uh, and in fact, that's how we met. Is that I would go in and like butcher parties of people, and and absolutely terrify terrorize you know people who are like trying to gather resources and stuff like that. Um, and the people who were good sports and like laughed about it, like I I wouldn't say I would have mercy, but like uh I'd always be cool about it. You know, and it's like people who like who had like general had like genuine questions like, hey, man, like I cannot find you. I cannot kill you. What is going on here? Like they'll turn to like honest dialogue of like, oh, hey, man. Yeah. So what's happening is X, Y and Z. And this is what, you know, why you're not successful or this is what you could do differently and blah, blah, blah. And it was always like good spirited. And then you'd have people who would just absolutely lose their marbles when you killed them. And uh it was it's i would i would describe it as like intoxicating the level of uh salt that you can mine from people if you will mm-hmm. uh but it was it was always a good time and uh you know with that i remember there was one time that uh i and i didn't know who this person was we ended up becoming friends but apparently my name had like made it around enough in the community so that, like, when I showed up, someone, like, already knew who I was. And they already knew. They're like, oh, fuck. He's here. And uh, that was an awesome, cool moment. <laughs> because, like, in the environment of, like, Fallout, where, like, a lot of it, a lot of that game, uh, Fallout 76, where a lot of that game is just the community interactions with each other, having this uh, being, if you will, that is almost like mythical it like shows up and terrorizes the situation and like just creates ca- chaos and like mm-hmm. it's enough that like other players are like oh my god is that him oh no it's him like that is a cool moment and i i i would love to be almost on the other side of that and experience uh how that goes to so like uh it's so interesting um cuz like i i you probably remember too but like back before fallout 76 came out uh todd howard was hyping the game up as is his responsibility um be like hey you know you can like there there's you know there's going to be no other npcs in the in the like you know friendly npc so it's all like you know player driven like there's you can trade with uh other people who have skill sets that you don't uh you can they say hey you know, I need this specific thing from this location. Go get it, and I can make you this weapon. Um, it's it's very interesting to think that because I what you're you're saying that what you basically would do is set up at uh, workshops, uh, or well, like I guess yeah, set up at workshops, and when somebody rolls up and claims the workshop or tries to claim the workshop, you just like fucking like take them to the cleaners and it sounds like you would do it very easily because of uh how you manage to um i guess saying manipulate the game is uh, in in an incorrect way of phrasing it but more so your your expertise and your knowledge yeah become good at my craft if you will yeah yeah you 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 learned enough about how the game worked to be able to manipulate it in your advantage. I guess some people would say that that's manipulation, but in in a very real and actual sense, it's not manipulation. You just have studied the game enough. It's like saying somebody who is capable of counting cards is manipulating the game or cheating. And they're like, well, it's not really cheating. You just understand the game that deeply. Um, and to it's it's so it's interesting to think that the the actual like pvp element the 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 role playing the character the person to person interaction that whole like becoming part of the story because you were talking about um you were talking about the 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 guy who had the camp that was basically like the weapon shop and like that 
that that very thing that Todd Howard was talking about the uh, the community is the game kind of uh, kind of thing. It's so interesting that something like that resulted in someone like you who some people would say that what you do is, you know, trolling, griefing, stuff like that. But whether it is or whether it isn't is irrelevant to the point. The point is that it's still so interesting that that sort of community individualism and that community self insert, as it were, you know, taking on the role. It's so yeah. interesting that that results in somebody like you who is as, who is so experienced with the game that you become almost, you know, a final boss in a sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that, uh, I always thought that that was a real cool thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think, I think like that's how we met. I remember you and like a couple, I think it was one or two of your friends. Yeah. Um, let me, I, I, I actually remember that very vividly. Let me, let me, yeah. Let me, let me hear your side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So, so I think, so I think uh, we actually talked about this after the fact. Um, but basically, what happened is, um, I have a I have a friend, uh, Winter. She has been in a couple of my videos in the past. Uh, I forget which one specifically. I know she's been in a Fourth of July video, but she's been in a couple of other ones. Um, we were playing Fallout seventy six. I don't remember why. I I wasn't recording anything. We were just playing, um, and we went to the uh, the abandoned munitions factory, which is located in the very, like, almost dead center in the far north of the map in the in, right. the, in the Savage Divide territory. And we, I, this is, it was a while ago, so I think maybe we were going there to print ammo because at the time the. Uh, the like ammo printer device that you could have at your camp wasn't out yet. Um, right. And the ammunitions factory was like a hot, like that was hot property for practically everybody in the game because like you go there, set up shop and then like do a little bit of uh, building and then power the, the ammo press and it just prints ammo for you, which back in right. the day yeah. was it was a big deal. Yeah, that that again, that was that was hot property. I I'm pretty sure a lot of uh a lot of PB, PVP groups like, you know, Fallout 50, the Enclave Raiders, stuff like that. Um they would specifically claim that territory uh for purposes of printing ammo. And like a lot of traders did the same thing too. Um but so what happened is me and Winter went there I believe to try to take the proper or take the location because I think at the time somebody else had claimed it, but we were going there to also try to claim it for yeah. ourselves or maybe it was just a band. I don't, I don't remember. The The point is we went there um, and there was actually somebody else who showed up separate from us, just like one other person. Um, and I think that might have actually been who you saw because from what I'm remembering and what I'm recalling at the moment, I think you might've been there before anybody else, but you were, you know, obviously waiting most likely. Um, and then that person showed up and then I think we showed up at the same time and then noticed him. And then we, and then we just started dying left and right. And we're all like, w- w- what's happening? Who, what, what, why are we dying? What, what the fuck? What the-? And you were using a, uh, um, a Tesla, uh, a Tesla rifle at the time, um, yeah. because it had, it, it, you know, it had the lightning thing. It could jump from person to person. So, uh, you were using it and, you know, you were invisible. So we, and specifically because lighting in there is awful, we couldn't see you. So oh, yeah. we're, we're in there trying to figure out like, where is he? Um, and I think a couple times we were able to find you and I think I got a couple shots off on you, but you just... It, it it felt like you were one hitting me. It was it was pretty ridiculous. Um, but after a while, uh, a very short while, the other guy left, um, and it was just me and Winter. And I think she was more she she can get she can get a little tilted sometimes. Um, 
but uh, but after a short while, she's like, "All right, let's leave." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no. I'm 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 interested now." And I I try because you know I knew that voice command was a thing, so I tried to like call out to you a couple times, but my fucking uh my fucking voice chat thing wasn't working. Yeah. Um, and so I'm struggling to try to fix that. And I could hear you a couple times, a couple times you called out, uh, and then eventually, uh, cause I was, on, I was on a discord call with winter and I think I had, I think I had her actually say like, Oh, his mics, uh, his, his area mic thing isn't working for some reason. Um, and then I just remember you were eventually just like standing on the roof waiting for me. And I walked up and I got my mic working and then we just like talked about like, Hey, you know, like what's the, what's the skinny here? What's going on? And then we talked about, do I about, keep evaporating? Yeah. Right. Like how, what, <laughs> how are you doing that? How are you taking like no damage? But like, it's, as you said, the, uh, the people who, who take it in, uh, in stride, the, the dialogue opens up, but it was, it was still at the time it was, fucking wild because me specifically I don't do a whole lot of like PvP stuff in any game because I suck at it <laughs> um, but it was it was it was mostly like as you said just the like how are you doing that kind of stuff yeah you know um, that's awesome to hear you know your side of it mm -hmm. uh, so to kind of like piggyback on that um, so like from my side is the ammo factory is absolutely a hot ticket area and how when i was when i would try to um contest workshops and stuff like that it's not a very popular thing to claim those workshops because unfortunately um in that game is kind of let's backtrack a little bit here fallout 76 as a whole has changed many times like different iterations throughout its uh, lifetime, if you will, mm -hmm. since launch. And initially, like you said, it was created to be a player-driven environment where uh, everyone could have like different skills, and some people could be better at this, some people could be better at that. Um, you know, because it makes absolutely it absolutely makes sense that like you'd have someone who would be really good at like crafting different weapons, stuff like that, because they're investing those points into that. Maybe they wouldn't be as good um, at you know maybe fighting other players, for example. Mm -hmm. So there could be like uh, a necessity there. There could be, you know, hey, you, you know, take care of like weapons and stuff like that, and I'll keep your camp safe. You know, that could be like a cool dynamic that you you could have going on. Um, and those workshops, because um, there's you know probably like twelve or fifteen different workshops, something like that maybe, um, are all over the map. And some of them more valuable than others. You know, there are power plant workshops that you can get, like, the fusion cores from. Or, like, uh, you know, the ammunition factory where you can get actual working ammunition from. Right. And, like, you, like to your point, before those things were available at your own camp, um, that was it. That was the only way you could get those things. Um, so if you didn't have a means to, um, you know, get a, your hands on these you know, nigh infinite resources because you have a friend who has been playing for a long time or you have this or you have that. Um, those were, would be the ways to go about getting those uh, objects. So the, uh, the power plant um, workshop is actually, has also maybe not defunct specifically, but as, as far as like a hot property location to be able to farm, uh, to, to farm fusion cores, um, mm -hmm it's actually been made semi defunct because I, I forget when, but, uh, uh, Bethesda actually put out a, actually, I think it might be a seasonal, um, like for the Nuka Cola season that's going on right now. I think it might actually be a, an item on the board. I could be wrong. Could be in the shop, but it's basically an item that allows you to recharge fusion cores. Oh, really? So, yeah. So basically, you just get fusion cores, use them, and then I don't know how how don't know I don't know how long they take to actually recharge. recharge. Yeah, but you can plug them back. You can plug them into the thing. I don't know how many a time I've never used it. I don't I don't use fusion cores, but yeah, it, the you can just plug them plug them in and recharge them. So the uh the the power the power plant workshop where you can actually farm fusion cores has more or less been 
been made defunct. I mean, it's still it's still a lot has of its value. Importance. And stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's still obviously, uh, you know, have it has value, and it definitely has value to anybody who doesn't have the item. But as far as like a wide scale, it's wide scale usage. Like it's yeah. it's it's taken a heavy hit. <laughs> well, see, and 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 that's a great example. Um, is that in the game of Fallout, it seems like the original shell of that game, mm-hmm. the original heart and soul of that game, um, has like excellent components. And originally, uh, player versus player combat was way more um, frequent. You know, you you didn't have to necessarily have to do this that awkward handshake. Um, the lots of fights could break out. This that, and the other. It's a good time. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the, these resources. Now, when you create a less of a need for uh, those interactions, I feel like you take away from the game. Um, I was always someone who would suggest that, like, hey, make it so the ammunition factory gave you three times as much ammo. Make it so those fusion cores were three times as impactful. You know, make it so it's a really good idea to take these workshops. So then more people would be invested in, hey, how do I hold these workshops? It's actually because a stronger incentive exactly. to actually take them and hold them so it could be like a group thing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that can be a lot of fun. Uh, what I, so kind of going back to how we met, is uh, right behind the munitions factory is... Um, like a like a cliff face, mm-hmm. and I would just uh, hang out on that cliff face and and monitor traffic on the server. And um, what I would do, and kind of like going back to what I was saying, is like the the acquiring of workshops from players wasn't as um, prolific as I would like them to be. You know, mm-hmm. I would like to jump on a server and see that there's five or six workshops claimed. That means I have five or six targets. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and unfortunately, that did not always happen. So what I would do is I would hop from server to server and look for claimed workshops. Mm. And then I would look for um, those players or like groups of players at those workshops. Cause they would tell me that they're like, there, there's like high traffic there. So going on to there, I didn't see anyone had claimed the workshop per se. Um, and how that would work is if they had, if they had logged up the server, if you were already on the server when they logged off, it would show it as still claimed. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I came on and they were gone at that point, then it would show it as vacant, but it would still look claimed to you and to anyone else who was already on the server, right? Mm-hmm. So I would uh, see that you and your friend and that other person, the other party, um, lots of people at this workshop. So that lets me know that there's a good chance this workshop's about to get claimed. And the moment that you claim a workshop, um, and it's like, in your name, I can immediately contest it and begin combat. Mm-hmm. And when I do that, everyone in that zone becomes a target. Right. So then, then cue me sitting on like that cliff face like Batman, <laughs> waiting for someone to make a move. Um, and then like you guys begin to have your interaction. And I, I remember um, immediately annihilating that other, that third party guy. Yeah. And watching... Uh, like the route that was to unfold. Um, and like, to your point, you know, you're like, you know, but like you, you did a good job kind of explaining that, but like to your point, like how it felt like you couldn't kill me or you couldn't put any damage on me. You know, that was intentional. Mm-hmm. That was like, my build was intentional to seem that way. Um, and I would say it was successful in that endeavor. But even despite that, I would still play my character as if it was like made of glass. Mm-hmm. So like, while uh, it was extremely um, strong and hard to kill, I would still play as if I wasn't. So then like, you create these scenarios where you have players like yourself who are actively trying to find me, thinking that like, if I can just find this guy... If I can just find this motherfucker, I can find, I'll get him, I'll get him, I'll get his ass. And then when you finally, it's like, you know, you see like the bad guy 
it's like a horror film where you're constantly like looking for the monster, right? Mm-hmm. You never really get to see the monster, and then you finally find it, and you're like, I got him. And then you realize the monster's way bigger than you anticipated, and you're way in over your head. Right. And uh, I, I loved being able to create that experience for others, whether they liked it or not. Uh, and I, I, you know, like, like to your credit, like, I remember, um, you know, you're trying to communicate and, uh, you weren't able, there was something wrong with your microphone Mm -hmm. and, um, your friend was like, like basically talking for you. And, uh, at that point you basically, cause I remember you, you guys had, like, like I said, you, you, uh, you had items and stuff that like when you died, you had dropped. And I basically was like holding you guys hostage, um, where you're not going to get your items back unless you take them from me. And I know in my head that you're not going to take them from me because I'm not going to let you kill me. Yeah. But I think, like then it's crazy. This... I think that was a big part of the, uh, the issue. Cause like I was, it was, it was just like a settings thing in the, with the, uh, the audio that I couldn't actually get back to you. And I think, well, that was where a lot of the, uh, uh, the initial confusion came from because I'm, um, you know, obviously besides just, you know, getting my ass handed to me over and over again, it's like, I just want my shit back. But like, I couldn't, I couldn't relay that information to you. Um, yeah. and it, it like, that's where a little bit of the frustration set in. Cause it's like, I just want my stuff back and you weren't able to be like, Oh, you want your stuff back. You got to come and get it. So my, I, I was under the assumption that, you were just killing me just because I was, you know, still there. Not because yeah. you knew that I was trying to get my items back and you were basically like, you you need to, you know, kill me first before you can get your yeah, items back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's the thing is it's like, um, those, the people who would just like give up and just like fold like a lawn chair, I had no mercy for. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you at least tried, you show some resolve, you try to fight back, you know, you try to, uh, like stand up for yourself. Mm-hmm. I respect that a lot. I respect someone who um, is going to try hard in the face of adversity. Even if you are, you know, you don't have the means to kill me. Like, let's say like you're not specced in a kind of way where you can like actually do damage in PVP. Mm-hmm. If you're still sneaking around and like you try to get the job drop on me and like, maybe you do. And like you come out around a corner blazing because you were strategic about it and you throw the grenade and like, now you're shooting at me. And then suddenly you realize, oh my god, I'm not doing any damage. Oh my god, what is going on? You know, and then you just get wasted. Mm-hmm. If we were on, you know, if I gave you a clone of my character, you probably would have killed me just then mm-hmm. because you outplayed me there. And I respect that a lot. Uh, and when people um, were good sports like that, you know, then, like I said, I, I respect that. And and most of the friends I have in that game. Uh, came from those interactions. Um, one of my closest friends in that game went by Metafox. He, uh, he really embraced the trader side of things, like where he would do lots of trades with people. Mm-hmm. Um, our first interaction is I was at the airport workshop, and I just kept killing him from different directions. Like, I would just reposition and just annihilate him from one direction. Reposition, kill him from another direction. And eventually he's like, hey, man, I'm not going to beat you. Uh, I, I yield. <laughs> Can you explain what's happening? Because right. this is like it's this is tremendous. I've never seen this before. That's probably like, he, how that's probably how our interaction would have. Uh, yeah. Would have ended like fucking 20 minutes earlier. if My fucking mic was working. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. You know, um, but I think that. You know, Fallout the direction that they've gone in with that where you don't need those workshops really anymore. You don't need those things. People want them. People take them. People are, you know, they don't know, but like, I think it is a cool concept that it's like, Hey, um, those bodies of water over there are are valuable, but mind you, there are sharks in those waters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the risk and reward needs to be great. You know, because the risk is like really great. The risk is huge. You know, I'm coming for you. Mm-hmm. But the reward needs to match that. And if it doesn't, then you're gonna have less people who are incentivized to do that. Do you think that? 
there's like a lot a lot of people um would probably describe the way in which you interact with the community like the way you play uh people would probably describe that as like griefing or bullying um i remember specifically one time uh it wasn't with there's only one time i've actually been like properly griefed in fallout 76 i hear like all the time from other people who say that they get like griefed by some people um i've only ever experienced it once uh funnily enough it was also at the ammunitions factory um i'd taken it and then like i think just like three dudes in power armor just came out of nowhere and just killed me and took my stuff and i'm all like guys i'm just and like i came back a couple of times i'm like i'm just trying to get my stuff yeah. Fucking leave me alone and they're all like <laughs> um right i got i got a little tilted i'm not gonna, not gonna sugarcoat it but uh, i didn't go like fucking off the walls or anything but they're all uh, i i had the the fosh not owl helmet on at the time and somebody yeah. hit me with a with a flamer and killed me they're like anyone up for roast owl and shit like that uh um, right and i'm like oh man um but uh, to to the point, um, as I said, some people would describe that as like, you know, griefing, bullying, stuff like that. Um, kind of a kind of a multi part question. But I guess the first one would be specifically either either within the confines of that concept, that understanding of how some other people might v- might view you in sort of a more uh unfairly antagonistic kind of way maybe unfairly is an unnecessary uh terminology but like in in a directly antagonistic way um yeah. do you feel as if that sort of reflects maybe who you are who you pre- who you present yourself as uh presented yourself as in the game specifically or how you interact with other communities outside of fallout. So I guess, I guess more so specifically, uh, as, as an instigator of sorts, whether that, whether it be malicious instigation, uh, respond, uh, 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 reactive instigation, um, as opposed to, uh, aggressor in a sense. Right. No, I understand what you're saying. Um, so to that point, you know, where, you know, is this griefing? Is it you know, harassment? <clears throat> I would say that it is yes and no, mm-hmm. you know, uh, do, you know, have I done my fair share of like trolling people and like harassing people and stuff like that? I'm like, sure. But for you specifically, uh, <laughs> would you define, would you classify like, because I, it, you know, trolling's kind of kind of a broad spectrum, like a subjective, like you know, to each their own definition kind of thing. Would you classify trolling as like bullying or or griefing or anything like that, or would you classify it as something a little bit more like lighthearted? Like if there was like a spectrum, would that be uh, closer to like you know like general tomfoolery, or would that be closer to like like hostile stuff? just for like context. Right. Well, so I, I would say that like, it just, it really just would depend on the response I would get, mm-hmm. you know, if, uh, if someone was a good sport and they're like, you son of a bitch, like, you know, and then they, they respond and they, they're going to come kill me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so now it's on, like we're going to fight. Um, if people respond and they're just like screaming at me, scream, you know, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you're just going to feed that fire more. Yeah. You know, I remember, um, a great example is like I said, like we, we, I feel like we had a, a solid interaction after, uh, you know, the course of some time, you know, and eventually I believe you got your stuff back and we became friends afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, another individual, you know, he's yelling at me, screaming at me and, uh, he's there with what I presume is his girlfriend or wife, mm-hmm. which is an interesting concept because that's not something I'm used to in the sense of like couples playing video games together like that. Mm-hmm. Because like now you just made yourself a huge target. Right. Because now I'm going to kill your wife and then I'm going to shit talk 
about that right to you. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wait, you're just gonna you're just gonna let me murk your wife? This is the kind of man you are. So you gotta think about this next time, you know, you guys do anything, you know, blah blah, you know, blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, the response you get from people is tremendous. Because then, all I want you to do is engage in this game with me. Mm-hmm. And because I've pushed the right buttons for you, here you come. And like the 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 best the best way to avoid that is to just leave. It's to just walk away, get away. Um, but people get so engrossed in it, man. I remember there was one um, where I could hear kids laughing in the background, and like this guy, this guy was like, uh, you know, he's talking shit, and like he was just getting smashed. And I'm like, dude, even your kids are laughing at you. Even your kids think you're a joke, dude. Like, and like, I have no idea what they're laughing about, but oh my God, he got mad. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. You know? And it's like moments like that. They're hilarious. Mm-hmm. And the reality is like, if he wouldn't have been so angry from the jump, none of that would have happened. And furthermore, I can't, um, I can't kill you if you're not in a workshop. If you're not in a, accepted pvp zone and when you go to take the workshop it says hey you know other players could come to contest this are you sure you want to do that Mm -hmm. so it's like this isn't like unknown knowledge per se people you know make these decisions and then they don't want repercussions Mm -hmm. you know ultimately uh if you're not geared for pvp you're not gonna do well Mm -hmm. now you could be geared for pvp and still get your ass handed to you by someone who just knows what they're doing. But if you're not geared for PvP, and then you enter in an arena of PvP, and then you don't do well, you can't be mad at anyone beside yourself. Um, and just in a sheer sense of like, well, hey man, I had to take these certain skills, I had to take these certain perks, I had to build myself a very certain way, which means I can't do other things. There's other things I can't do. If I really want to truly optimize my PvP build, I can't have all these crafting perks. Mm-hmm. I can't have all these, uh, you know, quality of life things. I have to be pretty bare bones with my perk cards and stuff like that. I have to be pretty bare bones with what I am in bringing to the table. It's kind of how, um, it's kind of like how I've specced my, uh, my character in a sense. I actually took a lot of inspiration from uh your build like the ins and outs of your build specifically and applied it to my own build so now basically um it would get, it would kind of be interesting to see who would win in a fight now because a lot of my armor is more spec to uh specifically like avoiding or absorbing damage and then my perk cards are stacked so that um if I'm standing still specifically I have a lower chance of getting hit and if i do i take less damage but then i have myself equipped with uh fast spitting vampire weapons so i basically just stand basically i stand in a location just shoot at anything that's shooting at me and if it hits it heals me for whatever damage i may have lost by standing there and yeah. I, like if I basically if I can shoot fast enough, I just don't die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really that's a really fun way to play that. Mm-hmm. For the, and, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you were making a you were making a point. No, um, so we're, are you referring to uh, Sentinel uh, power yeah. armor? I believe that's what it's called, or not power armor, but like Sentinel the property where you, when you're standing still, you don't take damage. Yeah, there's there's another one. Uh, it adds like an additional max like totally decked out at like full health i think like an additional 35 energy and uh and ballistic resistance and if you apply that onto if you apply that and the sentinel uh legendary which in and of itself those two specifically on the same armor would probably be close to a god tier role just based on how they work together um but you basically pair that with a a fast spinning vampire weapon like a flamer or a uh better a um a minigun um yeah. and then it basically makes it so that the higher your health so if you're at full health you get plus 35 from each uh armor plate so like chest arms stuff like that 
Um, and then you get the like 12, 15% chance to just avoid damage altogether. And so, yeah, like <laughs> you do it right. Uh, you, 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 you basically don't die. Like, as I, as I said previously. Sure. Well, so I don't know, cause it's been a minute since I've, uh, really dove into all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so like updates could have changed things and mm-hmm. they could have changed different, um, dynamics. I know when I played that, uh, uh, Sentinel assassin power armor, wasn't a thing. You couldn't get legendary portray of traits on power armor at the mm-hmm. time. Um, I know. And since then they've added that. I don't know if they've added those perks per se, but they've added so that you can get legendary traits on power. armor. But mm-hmm. um, the thing is, is that I used to fight against people who had those traits on power armor because it was like uh, illegally injected onto those uh, pieces of equipment and then injected into the game. Basically so I dealt with a lot for... of that. For context, he's basically you're basically saying that uh, your build was strong enough so that you would be able to defeat people who were in power armor, which objectively uh, is the strongest armor in the game, but more so were made even more powerful by the fact that they had uh, illegal um, legendary effects on them. Yeah. Well, um, interestingly enough, there is a huge cash market for those kind of items mm-hmm. outside of the game, like real cash market mm-hmm. um, to the tune of like people pay. I, re- I remember back then people would pay like $40 for that kind of power armor. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think Bethesda is really like cracked down on that. I mean, it's obviously like since day one been illegal to sell in-game items for real world money or to trade in-game items for real world money um i don't know how uh how big the market is now but i do remember that was uh that was definitely that was definitely like some some deep black market stuff back in the day sure you know but so then um you know when we're talking about like pvp on like that scale Mm -hmm. Um, those are like the big fish in the pond that I would like really enjoy going after because like I know now, cause like now the shit talking is immense. Hey man, you spent $70 on your armor and your weapons and I'm still handing you your ass over <laughs> and over and over again. You pathetic piece of tra- you know what I mean? And like yeah. you say stuff like that to people and they start losing their minds. Right. Mm-hmm. I used to have, um, a thing that I could just rapidly put down in workshops right. that would just be like, um, essentially billboards that I had like pre made Mm -hmm. that I could like rapidly put down that would like have like shit talking like messages on them. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so like what there was like fallout premium, there's like 1299. So I I used to have like a billboard. It'd be like, you pay 1299 a month for another man to like beat you down and like take all your (laughs) stuff. And it would just like be in like big neon letters. So like I would murder them. Um, they'd come back, kill them again, and then they'd come back and there'd be like a billboard in the middle of the arena mm-hmm. with like big, l- you know, lit up letters, like saying stuff like that. And people would just get so tilted. Yeah. People I, would just start losing their minds, you know? I think, um, I think after we touched base, um, like after we parted, after our interaction, uh, we went somewhere and then we went back to the ammo shop just to see if you were still there. And you weren't still there, but you had left a sign that said something along the lines of like an atrocity happened here. And then I think you had, yeah. I think you had like signed by Casador, not signed yeah. by, but you know, like hyphen Casador. Yeah, um, a terrible massacre has occurred here. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Uh. So basically, like you're you're saying that. Um, while in times, uh, while at times, um, you could be very instigative against people more so verbally specifically, because uh, as, as you're describing, you are, you're playing under very specific conditions and very specific, specific rules. Um, almost, yeah. Mostly because the game is limited in a sense to how PVP works, as you were saying, um, there's a handshake that has to happen. And that handshake is basically you shoot somebody and then they shoot back and you both have to hit each other. And then PVP is engaged. Um, 
So it's not like you were just going out and murdering random people. You were going to a workshop that was claimed engaging with that workshop to initiate PvE or PvP combat and then <laughs> fucking wiping the floor with them. Giving them the business. Yeah. No, exactly. You know, so then it's like, you know, is that griefing? Like, I don't know. It, it, you don't have to be there. You don't have to engage in this fight. You'd have to engage in this combat. You know, the the setting of Fallout, like li- literally, what are we talking about? We're talking about the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Well, you, you're telling me right now that if, like, um, you know, I'm in America. If America was a post-apocalyptic wasteland, that people wouldn't be shooting each other with guns? People wouldn't be, like, taking what other people have? You know, I, I remember a really famous example. Or not famous, but one that really stuck with me is I had a... Uh, an econ teacher, like mm-hmm. way back in the day. And he was like, you know, talking about like uh, just the world and stuff. And he's like, listen, you can either climb the apple tree and pick all the apples. Or you could be the guy who's waiting for the other guy to climb the apple tree and pick all the apples. And when his hand is full with a basket of apples, you slam him over the head with a club. And then you take <laughs> all the apples for yourself. So you didn't have to climb the tree. Right. Like, which one are you going to be? And like. You know, the reality of that is, like, if you don't want that to happen to you, you have to be able to defend yourself. Mm. You know, and, and like I said, uh, you know, once upon a time, uh, I was smashed into the floor by somebody, and I said, hey, I'm never letting that happen again. Mm. These people are, like, individuals who get, like, upset over, like, those interactions. Like, hey, man, you could either do something about it, or, I mean, I guess you can leave. Mm-hmm. Um. But you need to pick a lane, man, because uh, right now you just keep respawning and dying. So uh, I don't know what to tell you, you know. And people, you know, people don't like that answer. But, um, you know, to, like I said, your credit, like you're like, hey, so that sucked. Uh, how can I change things? How can I become stronger? Mm-hmm. And I would argue that, like, by becoming stronger, um, it made the, it's going to make the game more enjoyable. You know, mm-hmm. becoming stronger in, like, different ways and different uh, aspects. I wish that... Uh, more people saw it that way. But at the same time, you know, I, I came from playing, like, Diablo 2 back in the day when I was in, like, middle school. And, like, getting absolutely smashed by, you know, level 99s uh, who had just no mercy, dude. They're just, like, casting meteorite strike on top of, like, waypoints that you need to get back to, back to your um, corpse and stuff to, like, get your gear back. Right. So then you, you walk through the waypoint, you just immediately get slammed by another meteor. Like, it's just endless, endless destruction, you know? Um, so it's like, that is way more brutal in my eyes of just getting murdered over and over and over than, like, the interactions that you would see in Fallout. But, you know, um, not everyone saw it that way. Not everyone always um, perceived it as, uh, you know, it, it's just a game. You know, yeah. it's just a game. Um, and some people would take it, you know, super way too far. Some people are like way too crazy about it. I try to stay away from some of that stuff. You know, there'd be people who would, uh, I would always describe it as getting into resource wars mm-hmm. because, um, without really getting too sweaty about it, um, one of the strategies you can do in Fallout is to use your, uh, action bar. Mm-hmm as almost like a shield so that like when you take damage instead of the damage going to you most of it goes to your uh, you know action bar and um that's that's specifically one of the uh one of the i think i think it's a tip that i learned from you but that's something that i've applied to my build it's like a combination of serendipity dodgy and then i think one other thing um but it applies specifically to the action bar so one of the reasons i don't take a whole lot of damage uh, is specifically because it has to take a chunk. Uh, it either has to take a chunk of my action bar, or a part of the damage that would be applied to me is instead applied to the action bar. So, Correct. in order for me to like take full damage to begin chipping away at that boosted high HP that I already have, you got to start chipping away at my action bar. And because I have a big action bar, it's basically like I have two two or three health bars because first you have to get right. through the action bar then you have to get through my boosted ammo then you have to actually get at my health which i can re i can gain back because of my my vampire uh uh minigun 
Right. Exactly. So um, something that you could do is you take the cola nut perk, which makes it so all your um, cola products are like uh, extra beneficial, mm -hmm. and you um, spam Nuka Cola Quantums. And it's something that you can do uh, very effectively on PC and people on Xbox. I've actually watched it, and it's like a complete like disaster mm -hmm. because they don't have hotkeys, so they have to open up their menu and like drink like 15 of them. And, and then, like, go back to fighting, like, in the <laughs> middle of combat. So, like, what they'll do, and it's it's so stupid looking, is uh, they'll be in power armor or, like, they'll have, like, a jetpack, and they'll fly real high in the air. Right. And once they hit the peak of that flight, mm -hmm. they'll open up their menu and drink all of these items so that, like, hoping that because they're way up in the air, they're hard to hit. Yeah. So as they're plummeting to the ground, they're restoring themselves. And then once they land or get close to the ground, then they're ready to fight some more. That's that's pretty smart. I don't think I would have thought of something like that. But again, I'm not a big PvP PvP guy, so I don't think about stuff like that. But that's pretty clever, given the limitations of the Xbox. Well, you know, so in the, so then it's funny. So as someone who is not a console player, seeing that you're like, oh my god, this looks retarded. <laughs> like, what is going on here? So, you know, so we just it would hit. Uh, you know, we'd have it on a hotkey like one through four or something like that, and you just you know spam you know. Uh, a couple of colas, get mm -hmm. your AP right back full. And uh, so that was a viable strategy. Yeah. And I remember um, that people would abuse, abuse that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I initially disliked that method. Um, and then I started going around and I wanted to see what, if it was possible to obtain those things on your own like was it actually possible to get a substantial amount of nuka a nuka cola's quantums um in the in the sense that like you could feasibly spam them in combat mm -hmm. and what i learned is that if you build up enough relationships with enough people um you know you just kind of go around like hey this is what i'm looking for uh, does anyone have anything to trade? You'll get, you know, three here. You get two here. You get five from this guy. You got like, ten from this guy who's been saving them up. You can buy them from different stores, like in like really, really small quantities. And then, you know, you could have an amount of them. And if you only use a few of them in combat, which is something I would do because I don't, I wouldn't get hit very often because you couldn't find me very often. Mm -hmm. um, but if you did it like you play like that, then like that was totally feasible. Now, what's not feasible, and kind of getting back to what I was talking about with resource wars, is that you have these people who um, have abused the game and have abused like the inventory system, and they have a damn near infinite, infinite amount of those resources, right? right? So, like, I've come across people who have posted uh, pictures of like their inventory, and they're, I mean, they're sitting on like two to five million quantum's. Jesus. So then it's like. In theory, you could have an auto clicker who is just hitting the hotkey button, mm -hmm. just fueling um, your character with these quantums. Right. And I mean, you could just have it just run, and you could just have that on during a fight. Mm -hmm. And like, even I, uh, well, I wouldn't say that. I was gonna say even I wouldn't be able to kill you. I've, uh, I've, I've found ways it around that. Would just that. be a lot harder. It would well, it would be longer. almost impossible. You'd have to one-shot them. Hmm. And typically in the game, that is not something that's feasible because there is a damage cap of 110. Interesting. Um, so you can only do 110 damage at one time. Uh, but I found ways around that, um, you know, like through tricks of the trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've experienced those players before. There was um, the leader of this Chinese PvP clan. Um, I actually have like a really good clip of it. Uh, I killed him with one shot, and you could actually see it happen originally because the farther you are away from a target with certain weapons, you have a damage drop off. Mm -hmm. And the initial shot I take on him with the damage drop off, you could see his health go from 100% to 20%. So like it would have killed him at close range. Um, but, but then you see it immediately rocket back to full. Um, instantly, and mm -hmm. it's because of all the resources he's using. So he's basically doing what I previously described, where he's just like spamming those resources at such a high frequency that any damage he takes, he immediately restores it. Right? Wow. But then he got closer, and that's where he was mistake truly lied. So mm -hmm. once he got closer, I was able to be within that critical kill range. Mm -hmm. Um, 
if you think about it, the 110 damage cap, right? If someone has uh, a lot of health, if someone has any amount of health, right? 110 could be substantial or it could be minuscule. Mm -hmm. um, a great example is, uh, if, you, if you don't mind me asking, so on your character, like, typically, like, let's say we were to, like, run into each other, how much health do you think your character, like, would sit at? Oh, God, I don't remember. It's been it's been a minute since I've actually opened up 76 and done some, some stat stuff. Um, I want to say the last time I checked my health, I was at, like, three four hundred something like that i could be right. i could be way off like that but for 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 sake of uh conversation let's say let's say 500 even and more so so i don't have to open up the game and check <laughs> no of course so um i would say 500 would be very high mm -hmm. at least you know back then i don't mm -hmm. know how it is now things could be a little different but 500 is pretty high mm -hmm. um Typically, you'd see people with like two to three hundred health. So then, if the damage cap is one ten, and you're actually hitting for one ten, mm -hmm. um, you kill pretty quick. Right. But uh, the people that I would be playing against, and myself included, um, through uh, natural means, but through very advanced means of like knowing what you're doing and like creating um, this for yourself, we could be looking at like. 800 to 900 health mm -hmm. which would then give you a significantly larger grace period to be like oh god i'm taking damage let's heal that let's right. fix that so then you got to think if i'm able to one shot somebody with 800 health how much damage am i doing and that's where it would get kind of cool mm -hmm. and that's where i like i really enjoyed like doing that min max stuff um, because then it kind of found a way to deal with people who were taking advantage of different systems. Because the reality is if you're truly just collecting nuclear quantums uh, and resources like naturally, by like just going around making trades with people, uh, going to different vending machines, this, that, and the other, you don't, you'll never, you know, you might have a lot, you know, uh, over a couple months, a uh, month's time, you might have 500, 600 quantums, but to spam them in such a, um, like with with such little regard for like the actual investment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you'd have to have thousands of them, millions yeah. of them, right, to like not care. And uh, that's where I think it gets different, you know. And so I would actively, I would either try to insta kill those people, or I would just avoid those resource wars because that's that just wasn't very fun to me. It becomes um, it becomes more of a thing where. One, you are engaging with um, uh, both both legitimate and illegitimate players, um, and the ones that get like super tilted and get real mad at you uh, are either doing it because they are uh, they're playing illegitimately and they've never had to actually deal with um, like losing like that. Or mm -hmm. they're the, the legitimate players who are losing constantly and are getting mad about it. But more specifically, they are in and of themselves taking on the the onus of engaging in PvP. Like, I mean, me specifically, um, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've more so rationalized it in my brain. Um, I don't like playing super hard games right so like i i play a lot of uh i play a lot of civ 6 right i don't like playing Love that games. Game. yeah right it's fucking amazing um i don't like playing on deity level just yeah. because you know the the game is sort of stacked against you in that in that case and for some people yeah that's that's fun it's more challenge you know engages your brain more actively but for me I mean, yes, there there is still that that challenge. Like, you know, Dark Souls, for example, like the Souls series in general, is made to be hard. In some cases, it's made to actively fuck with you and actively actively like piss you off. But right, it's still that that challenge. Like, it is something that you can get over. But if you're bad at it, it's your fault. You're bad at it. And I never enjoyed those games specifically because I don't like hard AI. Because there's a very there's a very different feeling when you lose to a computer compared to like when you lose to a person, 
right? For sure, for, for good it's or bad. It's way more personal. Yeah, but sometimes that that personal loss works in like a positive way. So like if you lose to somebody in like you know Call of Duty or Fallout seventy six or just some other just any other game that has like a PvP a person versus person engagement. When you lose that other person, it could be, you know, oh, like fucking like this is bullshit. You suck. I'm so pissed off that I lost. But then at the same yeah. time you play like, you know, like a uh, Mario party, right. Or some other party game with like yeah. your friends or just random people. There's a, there's a stronger likelihood that you will experience a more positive, like, Oh, I lost. But in a sense, even in even in like the angry sense, you kind of feel better because you lost to somebody else. It was it was in a sense a worthy challenge. It was a it was a person it was an actual person versus person interaction and you lost because the other person was just better than you. That's fine. But when you're losing to like an AI or like the game itself, you're losing to a computer, like that's not fun. Like there's no sense of Oh, like I lost, but this other person won because they, you know, were just more skilled than me. It's like, no, they just, you know, made the, they just made the computer no longer easy. And yeah, they made it just, uh, artificially harder instead of like making them play more strategically. They, uh, they do that a lot in civilization where like, they'll just give them more resources. They'll give them additional technologies Instead of just like making it like play more intelligently, which mm-hmm. is the that's that's a much more difficult thing to do as a developer. Yeah. How do I, you know, program this AI to be able to do these things? Yeah. I remember um, StarCraft. You know, uh, kind of going back in the day. You know, StarCraft One. Mm-hmm. I used to just get like shit on by fucking Korean kids constantly, nonstop, because there was no matchmaking to be heard of. So you're just getting smashed by these people who are just so much better than I am. And kudos to them. That's that's also yeah. not a... Uh, I just, just want to preface, because I, I don't know who's in general is going to be listening to this, but that's more so, like, that's not, like, uh, a stereotype or a biasy thing. Like, Korean players specifically are just stupid good at StarCraft. Like, it, like, the, it, like they have StarCraft, like, before, like, esports became a thing, like, Korea, South Koreans specifically were so like massively up on Starcraft that they would put like billboards and posters and stuff on like buses and the sides of what planes. What awesome time and stuff. to be alive, right? I know, right? Like pre esports <laughs> South Korea. Well, I remember, I remember uh, hearing and then reading about that they uh, like would like play Starcraft during recess at school. I believe it. Like. How cool is that, man, that people are that involved, that you have enough people that like are interested in it, that like people are actually uh, sitting around during recess and watching it. I remember like way back in the day, dude, I used to like play like Yu-Gi-Oh and stuff at recess. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine um, how cool it would be to like watch a group of friends, you know, like these two people are going at in Starcraft and then you have like a whole friends group who's like sitting around them. Um like watching it and cheering it on like that'd be so cool right but so like that is uh, a norm of like you know from like uh, a social and societal uh side of things yeah so then uh these dudes are honing their craft playing against their friends in school all day and then they come home and just annihilate you know uh 12 year old Patrick right <laughs> just trying to like you know put his base together you know and like, they're... I just like being the Protoss because they have energy spheres and that's cool hey man do you leave my pylons out of this like okay. bro <laughs> yeah um, but so then in Starcraft 2 I remember uh, I, I would I never got to play it or anything like that but I know that someone made a um, artificial intelligence that was like learning like Grandmaster Starcraft two player mm-hmm. like uh, strategies, and then like playing against real people and like handing like real Grandmaster people at Starcraft like losses yeah. through like AI intelligence and not necessarily being like having more resources or having faster build times or anything like that, but just like outplaying these people. And I think that's very cool. That's yeah. very that's very cool to play against, and that gives you replayability. Um, and I think that's where with like Fallout. Um, and stuff like that is it it was always replayable because you never know what you were going to get when it comes to like fighting people you never mm-hmm. know who you're going to encounter um, there'd be 
days where um you know you're just smashing uh people who are not equipped to handle you in any way shape or form and then every now and again you would get like a big fish that would like enter the arena mm-hmm. and like it would be like an actual fight you know and like those would be like some really cool moments like i said like when i um hopped on a server and i saw the leader of uh that chinese clan or whatever mm-hmm. uh pvp clan i couldn't i was like frothing at the mouth i could not help myself and i'm like i have to bring him down and uh I'm like, you know, it's like one of those moments, mom, get the camera. You know, I started like, I was like, uh, I like immediately like turned on like all my Twitch stuff and I started like streaming that like so I could like secure that clip. Right. Um, You know, but like to your point where it's like I had become like almost like a the end boss mm-hmm. of like Fallout, you know, stuff like that. Like those are like the prize moments that like I really remember, you know, taking down like uh critical and key pe- people. And I'm sure he never knew who I was. I'm sure he was extremely confused when he instantly died. Right. Cause I'm sure that never happens to him. Cause like yeah. that, I, I've never been insta killed by anything. So I'm sure like when that happened, he's like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and like, I remember once he dropped all of a sudden, like that server was just like flooded with like all of his like clan members and stuff. Right. So like, I knew that like at that point, like, like I, I got on someone's radar. Uh, so that was cool. Do you think that, um, I guess, cause, cause we kind of tried to, 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 f- to define specifically like how you were engaging with the community and whether or not the way in which you were engaging with the community, whether intentional or otherwise was a, um, you know, could be considered like bullying or griefing or anything like that specifically for, to like define it as, uh, that's sort of like, I guess I would say that because Fallout 76 isn't PvP specific, like it's a PvP game, but like the PvP element isn't like the main part of the game. So yeah. whenever somebody wants to engage with PvP, they kind of have to seek it out. Would you say that? something similar to the way I guess, I guess that specifically like in like actively going forward and looking to engage in PVP in a game that while including PVP isn't specifically tailored for PVP. Do you think that is something that you would recommend that more people do more people do less and under either condition, whether or not you think it's a net gain or uh, a detractor as far as the community in general. So in, a, in other words, um, uh, you probably know that Fallout 76, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people in the community and a lot of people outside of the community that more so know about what goes on in Fallout 76 think that it's like it's just a very positive game like every everybody is like super helpful and stuff like Kumbaya. that yeah, yeah dude yeah um i totally understand what you're saying here yeah like again do you think that uh it would be beneficial for the community for gamers in general to engage more actively in pvp or do you think in in like the larger scope it would be more of a uh uh, a hindrance for players, community, things of that nature. That's a good question. I think that, um, right. So like it's a game, so it's not real life. Cause real life would be way more dramatic. It would be way more impactful, but you're playing this game to be entertained. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, why do you watch a Marvel movie? Do you watch a Marvel movie to, um, you know, to to see uh, the interactions between characters, like maybe, uh, but typically you're watching it, and it, you know that is part of the plot. The bigger plot is you have this group of heroes that are trying to take on a villain. Mm-hmm. You have this these group of individuals that are trying to accomplish a goal of some sort. You know, and without um, these villains, without Thanos. You know, without the Joker, Batman wouldn't be nearly as interesting. Mm-hmm. Without, you know, Thanos, you're the sacrifice Iron Man, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> makes, wouldn't be nearly as impactful. So it's like, 
when you look at like the community as a whole, um, you're going to have people who are going to be bullies. You're going to have people who are going to harass others, which just means that like now you are presented with an opportunity to be the hero. You're presented with an opportunity to fight this guy off and like save the day. And like, as, as many times as I have come across, um, people who are just mind their own business, who were building in a workshop, that, that, that was a poor life choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have absolutely obliterated those people. And then they got mad and I've like trash talked those people and took great hilarity. Um, as many times as that's happened, I've come across people who are at tilted conflicts with other people like myself. Mm. And just the same way that uh, a fish will bite onto a hook and then you're reeling it in and then a shark comes along and eats that fish. Mm. My God, is it fun to uh, absolutely come wrong along and crush that person who is being a bully to somebody else to be the big fish. Yeah, sure. Has there ever been a, um, a situation in which you engage in, uh, uh, I don't know, calling it forced PVP doesn't seem genuine, but like the, the style in which you engage with other, uh, in other players, um, is there ever has there been a uh, an example of when you have done that and you felt specifically not bad because the other person you know like they got super angry and you feel like oh man I feel bad for that person because they're you know so angry or tilted all the time but has there ever been a situation in which you have engaged with somebody in that manner and then later felt bad about that specific engagement I see what you're saying um because like you, you're obviously going out there looking for sort of like a challenge, right? But has there been a situation in which you've gone and looked for that challenge, and the person that you thought you may find it from was a lot less, uh, how do I how do I say it? A lot less a lot more impacted by the way in which you engage them, and then you later felt bad about. Uh, how you engage them. Um, I see what you're saying. Um, not, uh, yes and no. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I think that it's, if this was like, uh, things like actually doing like, no, I wouldn't, I, you know, you can't just go around. It's like punching small kids. Right. Yeah. But, uh, and I remember there was one where, um, we tricked somebody. So a cool thing you could do is uh, if they hit you and you hit them back and now you've created this handshake, um, anything they own is fair game to be destroyed, right? Mm-hmm. So then if uh, if you do this and like they're near their like base that they've built, mm-hmm. like their home base, you can completely level their home base. Right. And all of the resources and all the work and time and effort that goes into that. Now, granted... If you have the resources to rebuild, you could just literally hit like a repair button and it'll just repair all those resources. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have the resources to rebuild, um, yeah, your base is going to be out for a while. And I think there was uh, one individual who they picked a fight at a workshop a little too close to their home base. Mm-hmm. And as a result, I pulverized their like giant base that they built. And uh, I remember, like, here I could hear them screaming, like, over voice shit. They did not have the resources to rebuild that. Oh. <laughs> and uh, they were having a bad day. So it was, it was more so not like, you know, some some twelve year old was having a having a bad day at school, wanting to, you know, just play around in Fallout seventy six. They pick up a workshop, and then you come in and just dunk all over them. Yeah, yeah no, it wasn't yeah. quite like that. Yeah, it was more this person just bit off a bit more than they could chew and you just had the opportunity to add a little bit of additional extra salt into the wounds and would would you say in retrospective that maybe even if warranted given the the circumstances maybe you went a little bit too far or would it or would you more so define it like you know like he he threw a punch in a fight that he had no way of winning and just had to yeah well it's like uh it's all it's all fair in love and war you know yeah. um so it's like if if you don't 
want like like the sims is a game that exists right so if you just want like building simulator and you want things to be all kumbaya hunky dory just do that furthermore if i wipe and this is something else that i think kind of like detracts from all of that is mm-hmm. that like if you get your stuff smashed in and you don't have the resources for it go to somebody's workshop or like um, their base you know um uh, and just like start talking to them, there's a thousand percent chance that they're going to be like, oh, I have those things. Let me build that back for you. Mm -hmm. And they're going to build it right back up for you. It's not that serious. Mm -hmm. If the game um, was like when it first came out and people didn't just have a whole bunch of resources, uh, because I think the economy of that game is kind of like lost in the sauce as far as it goes. Because like people just have those resources now. Like people don't need uh, power cells or like um, uh, fusion cores anymore. People just have like an infinite amount of them, you know. Yeah. And if you don't have one, just ask somebody, and they probably do. They're like, "Hey, man, I have like two mule accounts just full of fusion cores. Like, yeah. do you want any of them? Please take them off my hands, you know." Um, but like, so like all that stuff could just be rebuilt. I think, and what I would have really liked for them to do with Fallout is, uh, first of all. All these injected items and weapons and stuff like that, like you gotta get them out of there. You gotta get them out of your game. Like um, the uh, that's... the legendary, uh, the the legendary, like what is it? Or armor? Yeah, yeah. The the oh no, it's uh, it's legacy weapons. They call them now, like uh, like f- like what is it? Flamers that have like explosive legendary yeah yeah, yeah 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 explosive laser rifles stuff like that. Like you have to I think, I get think... most of. I think that they have actually done that. I think in like the most recent patch, uh, they they have uh, they have set it so that legacy weapons like that are either removed from the game, or like are made even less viable. Yeah. So I was actually because um, I knew I was going to be talking with you soon. I was uh, touching base with my my buddy Fox mm-hmm. about uh, the state of that game. Now, mind you, I have like two thousand hours in that game. Mm-hmm. He's got like 5,000 hours in that game, which Holy is crap. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was kind of like touching base with him. I'm like, you know, how is the state of things? Because um, he he was trying to get me to come back for a while. And he was kind of like saying, he's like, yeah, um, the PvP elements in that game have changed a lot. Uh, basically, because they've removed a lot of those legacy items, um, they didn't necessarily adjust how strong and tanky you could be. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to kill people now that like don't want to be killed Mm -hmm. it's like really uh i don't want to say it's impossible but like there's like a very few amount of avenues in which you can make that happen one of them is uh, a cryolator because there's not a good resistance against cold per se Mm -hmm. um so you're able to like punch through like a lot of armor and stuff of that nature and then if even if you are able to live long enough to uh fight off the cryolator usage um, you can get frozen, which your character will begin to slow down tremendously. Right. And what they could do, um, because again, no, this is like a like pro tip here. If you freeze somebody and you walk up and you bash them, um, they will go into like the flinch animation. Mm-hmm. And because they're frozen, that flinch animation will last like nine seconds long. And yeah. during those nine seconds, they can't use any supplies. Mm. So you hit them. And then you just do whatever damage you want to them, and they can't heal. They can't yeah. heal. They can't drink stim pack or uh, new colas. They can't. There's nothing they could do. Um, so if you have enough ammunition, you know, and again, we're talking about those people that get into those resource wars. That is a means to which you could just uh, win through attrition, if you will. Yeah. Um, which is not great. No. <laughs> but um, but like like you're saying, like I I think that they need to do away with uh, some of those abusable mechanics. They need to do away with a lot of those injected weapons and injected armor. And I think you take care of that problem and then you start seasons the same way uh, Path of Exiles and like Diablo do their seasons Mm -hmm. where every season you start brand new fresh. So that means that everyone would be on the same playing field. Everyone would be on the same um you know, uh, field to which they're like, Hey, so I need, I don't have a buddy who just has 40,000 fusion cores. I need to go get some. How do I get some? Well, there's a power plant. Uh, okay. I'm going to go secure the power plant. Well, there are other people that are also trying to secure the power plant. And now we have 
honest fights. You have honest fights between, you know, honest people. Um, and I think that would be, it'd be much more incentivized to kind of have that organic interaction. Um, but that's a lot of work. And I think the other thing too, is that with like Bethesda with fallout, um, a big, and I would say the majority of their player base and fan base are people who just enjoy those like happy go lucky interactions with other people in their community and builders. So there's not a whole lot of uh, aggressive individuals. You know, there's not a whole lot of people who are willing to put themselves in a situation where they might not win. So you're you're talking about something kind of a little bit more like Rust, where like every 30 or 60 days or whatever, uh, a, a map is reset, all the buildings are removed, uh, any gear that people have amassed is gone, and everybody just starts fresh. Sure. I think something like that would be a lot of fun. Um, I think I would I would probably I would I would agree, but I would say that people should be able to keep their levels because even like levels and perks, because even if you're like at a high level and perk, but you lose like all your equipment and stuff, uh you like you still have access to those cards. Kind of like a new game plus kind of situation, yeah. you know? Where yeah all the resources are gone and everything. Maybe you still have uh, your, your plans, right? Obviously you still, you know, you, you know all your plans for like stuff you can build in camp, any pre-made camps that you have or have set on the map. Maybe those are still there, but they just haven't been built. So if you go back to the location and you're like, Hey, I want to rebuild this. It's like, okay, cool, you can, but first you need to, uh, um, like, you know, gather the necessary materials. And then that could then in turn, as you were saying, lead to those, uh, those kind of interactions where it's like, hey, I need this workshop because I need like six billion wood or whatever. Uh, and I need to just farm this for a little bit. And the other person's like, hey, no, I need that for this reason. And then there's that actual right. PVP engagement thing. Um, we didn't uh we didn't we didn't touch on it uh at the beginning but um as you sort of alluded to uh you were uh if if i understand correctly you were banned from uh from fallout 76 your sure yeah <laughs> uh was your was your character actually deleted or were yeah so cavador is nothing more than dust at this point um uh, dust and memories um, dust and memories right but you can you can like start a new game. Yeah. So, um, it, man, it was a real interesting situation. Um, not necessarily the the ban itself. The ban is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, so in, in in Fallout, if you get your account flagged an X amount of times, mm -hmm. um, it will be automated to put like strikes against your account. And over two thousand hours, I um amassed enough people uh complaining about my account of just like destroying people that as a result my account was kind of given the three strikes you're out rule right um and eventually what they did was uh after the f second strike they gave it was like a it was like a four-day suspension right um and mind you you know, it's their game. They can do whatever they want, but they should be better about communicating like what's going on. Because mm -hmm. for like three days, like two days, I had no idea what was wrong with my account. Right. They didn't. No one. No one had like. I didn't get like an email saying like what had happened. And it wasn't. In fact, now I remember it correctly. It wasn't until I had was able to log back on that I received an email from Bethesda saying, "Hey, your account was um, temporarily suspended because of you know uh, X, Y, and Z. You know, basically right. like just uh uh." enough people have like reported you for being inappropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, after the third strike, uh, they just delete everything that's on your account. So all of your characters, all of your, uh, secondary characters, all your stuff, everything just gets wiped. All your items, all your 
plans, all progress. It's like if you had a brand new account. Mm. The only thing I think that would probably stay persistent is the stuff that you had bought in the Adam store or whatever. Oh, yeah, that would kind of have to stay persistent because, you know, you, right. you paid real world money for that. <laughs> Sure. Um, so like that would be that would be it. But yeah. other than that, um, everything everything's gone. Mm. Uh, and that was a weird time for me because uh, that was when I came when I found that out. I had just come back from uh, New York. I live in Indiana. I just come back from New York, uh, where we had uh, a little personal. No disclosure is um, my wife at the time uh, was pregnant with our daughter and we had found out that there was like complications and uh, we had, you know, we lost that pregnancy mm. and we had to go to New York for like a medical procedure to like take care of that. Right. And um, so like it was a really crappy time. And then I came home to find out that my count was wiped. Damn. So I was like, ugh, like yeah. one two punch, man. Right. Um, Jeez. But so then, um, at, you know, at that point, I was just like, you know, I had invested so much time mm -hmm. into the game. I, I just didn't want to do that again. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, at like, my account was like level like 700, level 800 something. Like, it was like a lot. Yeah. And uh, you were, you were up the, there. And the big thing with that is that, when you are high level like in that regard, um, you have access to some of the legendary perk cards. Mm -hmm. And because I was such a high level, um, I had like my bill like completely like fleshed out with like all the legendary perk cards. And I knew because like I have a lot of like great ties to, to the community that like at the drop of a hat, I could have someone power level me and I could have someone resupply me with all the the goods and bells and whistles that I would need to um, like completely restore my character, if you will. Right. But um, to me, what was really frustrating is no amount of uh, all of that could restore like, cause like that would get you leveled up to where like you have all your perk cards, but like it would be a monumental task to like get back to level 800. Mm hmm. Um, as, as far as like unlocking those legendary perk cards and it's, it would be a bummer to uh, be like a shell of my previous self as far as strength goes. Right. Cause like they're not the be all end all. Like if you don't have them that you can still win, but I know that it, it would, it, I think it would impact me. Cause I, in my head, I would know that I was once stronger than I am currently. Yeah. And I and like I would be like, I should be able to beat this person, but I can't because I don't have these things that they have. Just, and I should have them. Right. I should have them, but I don't. Yeah. Um. So, but you know, like at, around that time, you know, I just I uh I just found something else to play, you know, and I I uh it helped me kind of like get over that. I had never played uh, Destiny or Destiny Two at that point, and uh. It was a real nice. I, I started playing Destiny Two right after that, and it was like a real nice, um, well polished game, if mm -hmm. you will, to kind of like sink my teeth in to kind of like get over the FOMO of murdering people in uh, Fallout because I did miss it a, a, a bit, you know. And you know, it, it was what was really unfortunate is that um, when they nuked those accounts, they nuked my friends list. Mm -hmm. So like, there are people that. I would I would see quite often and I like, talk to quite often like people that I do like lots of trades with that like I would come around you know and then all of a sudden I'm just gone you yeah. know and like and there's no explanation you know and uh if there's anything I regret it was it was like not being able to like say uh tell those people like what happened and like say goodbye to some of those people or not um or you know just like I would hate for those people to think that like I just didn't want to be their friend anymore. Yeah, that's that's rough. Um, yeah, that's a uh, Bethesda. They're like, I don't know. Bethesda is a company. It's got incentives. It's got you know things it has to do. It's got obligations and stuff. But like, it, there's there's always there's always those situations, even when they're trying to do something that's like 
subjectively beneficial to them as a uh, as, as a company or them uh, as far as maintaining the community and stuff like that. Like subjectively, there's decisions they make that like maybe in the moment don't seem that big a deal, but sometimes they 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 do have uh, impacts like that where you lose out on uh, on friends and stuff like that because of the person or well well the person that you like remove from the game uh they lose out on uh on connections like that um there i i i wanted to this so what is what is what is today 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 is january 8th this podcast will probably be coming out sometime in uh early february so at at the time that it actually comes out this will be probably way big old news um are you on twitter uh not i mean like i have an account i usually just uh used to like check for um sports news and stuff like that because apparently that seems to be the place that they break stuff right <laughs> uh, on there but um i have an account if that's what you're asking yeah okay well yeah i guess just like on twitter in general and i guess that technically counts um it's interesting because you mention um a lot of times you uh you engage it doesn't sound like you were a massive like uh role player in a sense like you weren't part of like you know fallout 50 or like the raider the vultures or anything like that but you did uh in some semblance role playing esque things sure i killed a lot of raiders by the way right <laughs> i'm familiar with them i killed a lot of those people it's so like what what is this uh on January 3rd a I don't I don't know if this is the original source um that that put this information forward or whether they were retweeting it but I saw this account specifically um <laughs> winners use drugs <laughs> at winners use drugs on Twitter uh they po- the they shared an image that is from so like go going back a little bit um the uh in like the early days there were a couple of primary groups that started up um just doing role play stuff there was uh Fallout 50 who were doing uh uh first responder uh responders faction role playing they were basically like you know, cops, they would go around like making sure like, Hey, is like, is, is like, nobody's breaking any rules or anything like that. You know, making, crafting their own story, stuff like that. Like very, very harmless stuff. Um, the vultures are a, uh, a Raider role-playing group that popped up along maybe like before or after, I can't remember exactly, but they, you know, they would fulfill the role that, you know, you would expect Raiders to do. Um, there was a cannibal, group i don't remember what their names were they had some creative uh name um but another one of them was a group of role players called the enclaved armed forces who were basically just doing you know enclave role play stuff you know um a couple days ago on january 3rd this person uh winners use drugs on twitter shared a it, it it's like a post of sorts um, I, I'm, I'm going to say that this is all alleged stuff because me personally, I don't know anything concrete. I just saw this image and it says, it seems to be, uh, from somebody who is presenting it as an official statement from, uh, the EAF, which as you know, I just alluded to is the enclaved armed forces. And yeah. what it says is the enclave uh it's it's got like an overall title it says creating a safe environment and then the preface to this post says the enclave age has begun and then the actual post itself says in the eaf we strongly believe in proper behavior this belief system uh oops hold on uh, that didn't help at all um this belief stem this belief stems from the military philosophy of excellence that drives us to do the right thing 
We do this not because there is a rule, but because we are leaders, and we lead by example in the face of internet toxicity. As such, each EAF member will stand up for all citizens and will also go out of their way to support new players and actively police the wasteland. This means... Oh, sorry. What this means is any behavior, any fully capitalized, any behavior from the player base that is considered toxic or harmful to the, law and f- to the lawful enjoyment of Fallout 76 will be taxed by the EAF. In short, you will lose your camp and in some cases your player account. The EAF evicts toxic players from public worlds daily and is responsible for many account bans. This is your warning. Play fair, play nice, or we will come for you. For everyone else, please enjoy your local EAF world as you can be sure it will lack griefers, dupers, scammers, trap camps, and legacy u- legacy weapon users. What is your take on that? Oh, sorry. But before you before you add, before you answer that, uh, I also want to point out that uh, 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 the Enclave Armed Forces, uh, which is at Enclave underscore EAF on Twitter, they were uh, sourced. Their Twitter account directly was sourced in a. 2020 uh december 2020 polygon article titled titled fallout 76's huge fan war is a fight against nukes glitches and raiders and their account was uh their twitter account was included in that article um their twitter account does not exist anymore and there has even been uh an instagram post that shows that their uh, their actual website, EnclavedArmedForces.com, uh, is allegedly, again, this is all sort of still unfolding, uh, it is riddled with trackers, and for anyone who doesn't know what a tracker is, it's it basically allows somebody to look up your IP of, look up the IP of anybody who's actively, like, entering the website. So you're on the website and somebody, if there's a tracker on it, that person can see your ip address when you're on the website so it's like there's a very tiny chance that um that that could have been installed separately so it's that and the fact that the twitter account no longer exists is in and of itself not great but specifically um that that whole creating a safe environment thing. What are what are your thoughts on that specifically? Because this, when I saw this, I immediately thought of you because this is one hundred and ten percent something that, like, if if this had actually become a thing, you one hundred and ten percent would have become a target of this. I'm I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This this ends justify the means level of yeah. toxicity um what what do you think though sure um so to me <clears throat> to organize my thoughts here for a second because mm-hmm. it's a it's a complex situation a complex question mm-hmm. first i'd like to point out that if i were them and i was trying to target people who um that they're trying to target here mm-hmm having a means to track people who are looking at their website would mm-hmm. absolutely be a strategic thing to do because then I'm going to be able to target that player. I have their IP address, this, that, and the other. If I'm creating a big wave in the water, knowing that I'm going to get sharks to bite and come start swimming in my direction, um, that would be a great way to capture all those sharks. So you're going to have someone who is going to click on their website like who the fuck are these people like who they're going to tell me what i can and can't do you're going to click on their website and now they have all your information yeah um that would be a strategic thing and i bet that's probably what they're trying to do there at least you know for for buying into the conspiracy there right yeah if but if the um, allegations is that these people 
in some form or another are actually trying to track your IP address through their through their website. Again, allegedly, I'm I'm not making any claims myself. I'm just I'm just reporting on what I've seen. Sure. Um you know, yeah. That's going to be Bethesda's problem. Mm-hmm. Okay, cuz like so here's the thing is that um Everything they said so far is totally fine with me, except for um, the account ban part. Yeah, because what they're doing is they are they are overloading the um, report feature. You know, they're gonna. That's essentially what they're promising here. Is like, we're gonna report you so many times that we're gonna get this automated system to put strikes on your account, and eventually you'll get banned. Mm-hmm. But to combat that, you just have to see that as Bethesda and make adjustments to your uh, algorithm in which you remove and report players. Now, the problem is. Um, and like I can speak to this is like when your account is flagged, if you respond to Bethesda, um, a lot of times a they don't respond back. Uh, B um, they will respond and it'll be like after the fact. They're like, well, the reason why your account is currently deactivated and blah blah blah. And you're like, it's not currently deactivated. Like what? Like are you just guys? Are you are we asleep at the wheel? Like what are we doing, guys? Mm-hmm. Um, but you know if you ask them, okay, can you? Give me examples specifically of like things that like I had done wrong to um, incur this wrath, if you will. Uh, there's like no receipt, you know. It's it's like when I when a uh, credit card company is like, well, you know, you owe X amount of money. Be like, okay, cool. What did I? What do I owe that money from? You know, like collections agency. Uh, can you tell me what exactly you're collecting on? And like they have to to provide you with like some sort of like receipt of like a breakdown of like expenditures. And if they can't, then they they can't really pursue you. Well, it's their own company and it's their own game, so they kind of do whatever they want. Uh, but like, so when you ask them, like, what did I do specifically? They're like, well, we don't know, but you were flagged enough times. It's, that's a wrap. Right. Like, cool. So with that being said, having them take advantage of that kind of sucks. Um, if they posted that exact same post minus, uh, the account ban part, like literally if you would just remove that sentence, mm-hmm. I would, uh, as someone who uh, was like, you know, the terror of the wasteland, as someone who like had like that uh, moniker, I would love this. I would, I would love it right on its face. Uh, in the sense of like, you think you're gonna come do something about me? I'm gonna send all of your people back to your base in boxes dude like i'm gonna i'm gonna mail you back dudes like head like that's what's gonna happen here um and i would go out of my way to annihilate these people because the reality is um i i can't think of uh an individual who um was able to consistently beat me Mm -hmm. uh in pvp right so to deal with me that means that you're gonna have to basically run me off the server um, and, and just by beating me, and if you can't do that, then how are you gonna hold? You know, how are you gonna hold this? Um, this as like you know, like if you're gonna make a threat, how are you? Gonna, how do you back up the threat, right? So what I would do if I were them is you have you so you really you have two you have two options here. You um because like I would describe myself as like you know I would uh decimate people in workshops but i was never necessarily like like those people that were like oh we're the raiders i'm like eh, you can you can come get these fucking hands too dude like right. i would just annihilate those people right um so like i would i would describe myself as like a neutral party i would kind of like stay out of a lot of stuff mm-hmm. um but so then if i was the these enclave people i would try to appeal to like people like myself it's like hey you're really good at your craft we would like your help Mm-hmm. We would love to enlist you um, to uh, enforce these things, you know, because like ultimately 
again, now we're just adding cool, fun, interactive components to the game. I would love, and I mean love with a capital L, to have someone be like, hey, so we're a group of traders who uh, are constantly doing trades and this, that, and the other, and we are getting harassed by, you know, I'm just going to make up some stuff here. We're getting harassed by the raiders, Mm -hmm. and they keep killing us um, in the middle of our trades. They keep taking our stuff. We can't have that. Because of that, like, people don't want to trade with us anymore because they don't think it's safe. Um, Can you protect us? And like a fucking John Wayne movie from back in the day, dude, I would be fucking annihilating people as they approach the wagon caravan, dude. That'd be so fun. That'd be so fun. And it'd be a fun, interactive thing to do. Um, but unfortunately, the game is not that complex, per it's, se. It's actually kind of funny that you bring up that example specifically, um, because uh, recently, um, I, I don't know if you saw the uh, the IGN um, documentary that was looking at, like, oh, like, there's still people playing Fallout uh, 76. Like, what what's... It was it was basically kind of like there's still people playing Fallout 76. What's up with that? But in like a more like wholesome kind of way, like these people are still playing even after one of the most disastrous game launches sure. in modern history and are like, you know, have made, you know, they're they're, they're still having fun with it. Right. Um, right. In the documentary, uh trading specifically like in-game trading was something that they looked at and there are actually uh specific like groups and factions of people that do just that they they oversee and they moderate uh training trading situations because there there used to be situations in which uh people would like you know the the bad faith trading where somebody would drop an item and they'd go to pick up that item and then somebody like behind them who was like in the shadows would just like kill that person. And they just end up taking all their stuff. Um, yeah. there are, there are actually, you know, train trading bodyguards basically. Um, which as, as you said, is really cool. That's, that's real awesome and creative, uh, community building stuff. Um, based on what I've seen as far as this, uh, uh, this enclave, you know, policing, shenaniganery uh a lot of people are or as far as i've seen a lot of people have been really quick to point out the hypocrisy in basically saying like we're going to make sure that uh every server that we're active on is you know they're they're like there's nobody griefing there's nobody you know putting down trap camps which trap camps camps in themselves are just kind of an exploit of the game and not meant to be anything like specifically like targeting or harassing. It's just like, Oh, I made this thing. And if you walk on this thing, you get hit by a bear trap or like a pun. I mean like there's punji boards in or punky boards or whatever in the game as like a thing you can actually put down at your camp. And when you walk over it, you get a little bit of damage. Like this is part of the game, but more so specifically like there, a lot of people I've seen are pointing out like, Hey, so you have an issue with like, you know, griefers and toxic people and people who harass, uh, you know, people who are just trying to play the game. But then you say that the way you're going to make that not an issue is by harassing and being toxic and griefing. And from what they're alluding to, uh, false flagging other players who, yeah, may not be being, the nicest of people, but you're basically you're you're like I said, it's the ends justify the means, but you're using the same means that you chastised that you're chastising these people for. So a lot of people are pointing out that specifically. I don't think people have an issue with, you know, groups of people, you know, trying to trying to say like we're gonna we're gonna be the big bad guys around here, but more so the hypocrisy of it, right? And especially sure. since this is from a group that's role playing as the Enclave, a group that doesn't exactly have the friendliest connotations attached to it no, in the Fallout not at universe. All. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you could, there's so many other. Th- you could have been the Minutemen, I guess. You could have right. been like so many other things. But yeah, with with that specifically, I just wanted to get your take on it. Um, and from what you said, uh, I I kind I kind of expected that you would you would you know be up for the challenge and stuff like that. Um. I just thought it was real interesting because it's it's it kind of goes back to what 
we started the conversation about like started the interview about with with you becoming involved in the uh the pvp stuff because you were at first more engaging with the the role-playing aspect the stuff that um you know todd howard said like this is kind of what the game is supposed to be about people creating you know their own stories and stuff like that and so as I said, with that original thought, it's interesting that kind of notion of player freedom and pr- player creativity uh, would end up creating somebody like you who went on to create a legacy of infamy for themselves as being, you know, somebody like, like, like you said, a, a specter of the wasteland or, or what sure. have you. Um, and then that same mentality would also go on to create this group of people who have no qualms about using uh uh contradictory quote unquote toxic uh tactics. tactics yeah in order to fight toxic tactics it's like if batman shot people <laughs> right which one you know maybe he should but right. besides the point with that though is like um you know when i when i would kill people or just like destroy someone's base stuff like that mm-hmm. none of that stuff was like permanent yeah. you know like you could rebuild none of that stuff uh was long lasting and all that kind of stuff and like their people are you know they're kind of talking about like you know banning people's accounts and stuff like that and that's that's just real lame that's you know? some that's some next level that's some next level shit like there, there's a point where like oh we're just gonna like you know grief and mess with you a lot because we think it's funny but then there's like we're gonna go out of our way to get you banned because we don't like the way you're playing our game. Like, but you know, the, the other take of this though, is like who, you know, just cause, uh, I used to always like tell a lot of the young kids that I would work with is, uh, just because you say something doesn't make it true. Mm-hmm. Right. Just because you say that you're going to ban people, that doesn't mean you're going to, right. this could be, this could be, you know, some middle-aged dude who's like hanging out in his mom's basement. Uh, you know, with him and like three of his buddies who are making the on, we're bringing the enclave back, boys. Yeah. Like, you're not gonna do shit. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it could just it could just be that. I don't know of uh, this enclave group. I don't know how big they are or little they are or whatever. Um, well, it's weird because I I was also kind of like I knew there was enclave groups. I didn't. I don't know if the group that I knew about was the same as uh the same as the the group that posted this specifically i don't think yeah. it is because one uh one player that's pretty pretty decently known in uh uh in the fallout 76 community role play community specifically um they go by president dash uh he actually commented this and he says a shame a shame to see such a toxic community of griefers so I would imagine that this group was at least at two years ago big enough to be included in the Polygon article, but is perhaps either now or is no longer associated with being like the forefront of the Enclave role playing group. Um, but it's it's I it's more so specifically, like I said, it's just so interesting that the you know, the, the basic idea that Todd Howard was pushing forward, like, uh, the community crafting the, the story and the, the overall arcing goings on in Appalachia, uh, that it ended up, uh, something, you know, like this, you, you, the (laughs) murderers and toxic players in, on, on every side of the, of the spectrum as it were. Yeah. You, you know, um, you know, you see all that and it just, it really reminds me of, uh, do you remember when uh, I believe it was Antifa or something like that took over like a block in Portland? It was, uh, it was in Washington, the Washington. Um, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was uh, Chaz or whatever it was called. Yeah. And it got, it got, uh, it got, it, fell apart after like a week or two, I think. Yeah. And then like within that week's time, the people who like were trying to like, you know, uh, create this like utopia, if you will, mm-hmm. um, were like threatening 
people in that community with like guns that like hey if you don't comply with like what we're trying to do here like you're, you better either get out or we're gonna harm you and it's like a, a lot of those people at the time were really protesting the police and it's like what are the police if not someone who is um going to accomplish a goal by force if necessary yeah right like like the, a strict definition you know whether you you're for or against whatever but like uh, if if you know a police officer says like hey stop your stop the vehicle if you don't you know there are going to be consequences ultimately uh, at the end of a gunpoint right yeah so like you're pro- protesting that and then you're doing that in your society uh, not even a week later you mm-hmm. know to try to uphold it and then like it kind of like to me it's like that is so contradictory um, and it's kind of the same thing here you know you're talking about like we're gonna deal with griefers what is more griefing than uh, spamming Bethesda in a means to try to get someone's account banned, yeah. account block. Now, if you're going on there and you see Kazdor is tormenting players in these workshops, and you show up and you fucking knock his dick in the dirt and you, mm-hmm. you know, uh, push him back, like, hey man, good on you. Like, yeah. good, good, like first of all, do fucking let me know how you did that. But like, <laughs> second of all, um, that's awesome. You know, and it creates that dynamic. Uh, I I think like I remember one time, um, someone nuked my base because I was killing them over and over and over, mm-hmm. and I was like, dude, round round of applause, man, round of applause for uh blowing my base up. Yeah, because it did it did two things. A, I like I have respect for you for like fighting back, and then like B, like once I rebuilt my base, it was still all radiated. So then I have like some fucking awesome green screenshots of like my base all glowing and yeah. fucking <laughs> cool looking you know but it's like those those moments right there it's like yeah that's worth playing you know i i know that um before my count was eradicated mm-hmm. uh i had a, a running kill total of like how many people that i have like killed individually because i keep track every day and uh it was like it was like almost, if not already, at like two thousand. Oh, geez. So like two thousand unique individual people had been like have some sort of Casador story to tell, right? The same way you did, right? And to me, that adds content and replayability to the game that other other means and other things just can't provide. And I think I think there's value there. You know, I think there's value. Um, for the person who tells the story of like, yeah, man, uh, I was, I was running from him and I, I, I thought I got away and he fucking blew up the truck that I was like right next to. And it sent me, sent me like flying through the sky as I was ragdolling, yeah. you know, in space, you know, like these, these are moments that, uh, it creates, people have. it creates the experience that, uh, you might not have otherwise. Yeah, you know, one of uh, one of my good friends, um, her name's Jen. We met in Fallout seventy six. Um, I was about to murder her and her father mm-hmm. at a workshop, and somebody else showed up to claim it from them right before I pulled the trigger. Nice. And I'm like, well, now clearly you got to die. Yeah. So, like, they were almost caught in the crossfire. So, like, just the other day, we were, like, laughing about it. I'm like, do you know how close you were to getting, like, absolutely annihilated? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, like, we, you know, and then we, we laugh about it and stuff. But it's, like, these were these cool interactions. And, like, her dad, you know, because, like, he's, like, a mid, like, uh, you know, in his, like, 60s. He's, like, sitting there, like, talking. He's, like, he's, like, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. This dude just kept, like, getting blown away, like, left, right, and center. And, like, he was just, his body just kept ragged on across the screen. He's, like, I was just sitting there, like, crouched down, hiding. I didn't want to be, you know, part of the, the massacre, you know? But, like, that was his interaction with that. And, like, had I not been there, had that guy not been there, it would have just been kind of boring. And I think that that yeah. is a... um a thing like a dynamic that should be um, enjoyed and cherished in the game. As far as like, these are entertaining things that are happening around us Mm -hmm. rather than something that has to be prohibited. And if you try to do it, we're going to try to get your account banned. What is a, um, so like there, I mean, 20, 2023 specifically, there's like loads of games that are, 
uh, going to be coming out that a lot of people are really excited for, um, for Bethesda fans, specifically, uh, Starfield is a real big, uh, a real big hype game. Um, oh, yeah. me personally, I'm super excited about that. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, like what games have you seen so far that are, uh, either projected, uh, this year or like in the near future, like the next year to, uh, 2024, 2025, something like that, like coming down the pipeline, what, uh, what games are you looking forward to? Yeah. Um, so what was that game? You said Star, not Starfield. What was it called? The Bethesda one that's uh, getting ready to drop. Yeah, eventually. Star, yeah, Starfield. Starfield. Okay, Starfield. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah. I hope that that game is everything that I want it to be. It looks like it could be very cool. It looks like it could be a lot of fun. Um, I so here's to fucking hoping, right? Right. Uh, if if they you know land the plane. I think I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I think the modding community could be tremendous. You know, if if you're if they allow people to mod the same way that they did with like Skyrim and uh, Fallout, where I mean, you, you know, in that game it shows, or at least it seems like you could go to like different planets and stuff. So like that means that people can like make their own planets. People can like have their own worlds and environments, which means that like I could, in theory, download like a mod pack of like different worlds and different planets and different like things that are going on in those worlds and planets. And then like, I could already see, I could already see a cool thing where it's like, if you want your planet to um, be part of our mod pack, you have to meet like these like certain criteria that is like vetted. So like, you can't just have like, you know, nonsense world going on here right where you got like skyrim with like the, all the dragons become tom's the tank engine like you can't you can't have that okay because we're trying to fit like a realistic theme here like how the rest of the game is but if you do fit our criteria then we will add you to our you know curations so then like i can imagine you know five years from now you download a mod pack that has like 50 different new planets that are like places that you could go and things you can do and these are like user created stories and user created like situations and things that are going on like that could be a whole lot of fun so i really i really hope that uh you know we see something like that and that it actually comes to fruition i've i've been seeing some people uh jokingly or otherwise say that there's going to be uh a mod for skyrim or for um for starfield that's just going to just literally be skyrim (laughs) oh yeah i'm sure dude you know you're gonna like sit down like your vr headset in that game like put them on and you're just gonna like wake up in a fucking wagon right but god damn it it's happening again more so specifically like they're, they're playing starfield and then it's like oh they go to a planet and then i don't i don't know how in depth, the modding thing is, but maybe you know you 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 you're going down to the planet. Uh, a cutscene plays. You have some engine trouble. Uh, oh my you god! End, you you crash end up crashing, and then you cart. wake up, and you're in the car. And it's like, oh Damn no! It. And I I hope I hope I pray to whatever divine force or cosmic justice or injustice Jeez. there is out there that whoever puts out that mod goes by the screen name Todd Howard. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I, they I, should do that anyway. You know, like that it. would be a hilarious little Easter egg in their game or something like that. Whoever, whoever, whoever's out there listening to this podcast, modding for Starfield, or planning on doing modding for Starfield, and you want to try to port Skyrim into Starfield, start a new account and name yourself Todd Howard. Like, just like, do that, that for going. me. Yeah, come on, let's let's do it. Um, yeah. So, so there's that game, and then um, the one, the one other like shout out I'd really mention, and it's a game that actually just came out, mm-hmm. um, but it's still like really in its infancy of like play, and it's like infancy of like content that will eventually be for it, right? Uh, and it's got a lot of uh, negative reviews from people who have mixed feelings about it, and mm-hmm. I, I definitely understand where they're coming from. I am very excited and I'm a big fan of dark tide. Mm. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the future of that game. What's, uh, what's, what's dark tide about? 
So so Dark Tide is a uh, PVE co-op game um, in which four friends uh, take on hordes and hordes of enemies and try to accomplish different objectives and this, that, and the other, uh, set in the for, uh, Warhammer 40k universe. Mm. And uh, oh that wait, game... no, yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that game predecessors were like the Vermintide series, mm-hmm. Vermintide One, Vermintide Two. Um, I am a huge fan of those games. I have countless hours in all those games. And uh, with Dark Tide, it, it came out to a rocky start, mostly because of uh, it was purchased by Tencent, mm-hmm. the company, and they're really notorious for like nickel and diming players like microtransactions Mm -hmm. and that is a justifiable uh gripe of that company Mm -hmm. but the gameplay mechanics and like the core uh fun of that game is completely intact and is completely um there right so it's like i think over time um you know like how like a lot of games will get like review bomb review bombed and ultimately like it's not like it's an unfun game to play. It's people that are mad of how Tencent operates its company. Right. And I know um, after Vermintide came out, Vermintide 2, they uh, they were bought out by Tencent. Mm-hmm. So it's Fat Shark the developer. So they were bought out by Tencent. You know, so like Fat Shark the company, you know, it's controlled by a CEO, I imagine, who you know is making decisions and this and the other. But like the person who is making this Warhammer feel awesome when I slam it into the side of this dude's head. That's not his fault. You know, it's not his fault that like there are dudes that are pulling the strings and deciding that, you know, this fucking dirty bandage that your character wears on his head costs four ninety nine. you know, right. that, that's not that dude's fault. Um, so like, I can't, I can get behind like shitting on that company for, uh, you know, those kind of, um, predatory practices as far as like, charging consumers for stuff that like they shouldn't be charging consumers for. But uh, the people who built the game, the people who designed like levels designed the enemy designed how like it feels to play um, far and away that that game has the best melee mechanics of like combat of like any game I've ever played. Nice. Um, I think, I think if you took the melee combat of that game and you put it in like Skyrim, it would be the greatest game of all time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It would be, it feels so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, if I, that and that's what I would do if I was Bethesda. I'd be like, hey, who the fuck made this Warhammer feel so good? Right. When you swing it and, like, it sends that dude ragdolling across the screen, hire that guy, have him work on our game. <laughs> have him make Starfield just like that, you know? Um, but that's, so that's, it's a game that just came out, like, a month ago, if not even. Um, but that's definitely a game that I am super invested in right now. What um, we've we've talked uh, specifically about like uh, um, I guess I I guess it would kind of be defined as like mannerisms, you know, how like how to engage more so with like communities and like uh like boundaries on like what is considered acceptable engagement and what could be more so considered like unacceptable engagement like the the whole like policing and then like trying to get people banned thing the way you specifically engaged in you gauged other people in pvp and stuff like that um what because you know especially nowadays people have like a lot of stresses and they're trying to you know figure out just how to you know do the best that they can what do you think that one ought to do in order to lead a good life? Well, that's a, that's a complex deep question. Um, what they ought to do to live a good life. You know, I, I think, I think ultimately, um, wow, that's a good question. I think ultimately, you know, when, when you're asking yourself that question and, uh, when you, are you know trying to find meaning to yourself as far as like <clears throat> the direction you want your life to go in direction you want things to go for you 
you know, I think being honest with yourself is a great place to start. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, you know, there are people who are not true to themselves, are not honest with themselves, right. are not honest with like their partner or not, you know, they, they struggle, you know, come to terms with like reality. And as a result, it just kind of complicates whatever is already complicating their life. Right. Um, I, <clears throat> before I do the work that I do now, um, right now I, I work in the heating and air business. Uh, so it's, it's actually a really busy season for us right now. Right. But before I did that, uh, the last 10 years, I worked in the mental health field. Um, so I would see a lot of people come and go with like a lot of different um, things going on in their lives. Now, I specialized in like behavioral health. And, uh, you know, I would say, you know, the greatest um, factor with a lot of those individuals um, was like the relationships that they held, the relationships that they have. And a lot of times those people, like certain individuals um, would have people who like loved and cared about them and they would drive those people away and they'd push those people away. And uh, I think, you know, having people you surround yourself with who love and care about you and are also able to be honest with you and tell you hard truths. Um. I think having that kind of environment is really cohesive to living a healthier life. I um I think that there there are some people who you know find themselves like kind of like shut in from society, uh maybe estranged from certain family members and stuff like that and uh it really creates problems because you don't have anyone who you know, all you have at that point are just people that are not invested in you, right? Mm-hmm. Like if I, if I, you know, we're gonna, you know, get super crazy here for a second, but like if I have a hygiene issue, let's say, right, mm-hmm. and I don't have anyone who cares about me or loves me enough to be like, hey, man, uh, I'm noticing this thing, or is everything okay? Or, are you, are you all right? If I don't have anyone like that. Who who is going to take the time and investment to really sit me down and have that conversation? Mm-hmm. You know, if if I don't have anyone in my circle or in my life who cares enough, no one's going to make that investment because that's a really hard conversation to have with somebody. Right. And there are so many similar conversations that can be so difficult and so challenging. So then when it comes to like actually having like a meaningful interaction, you know, people are like, my energy and my time is valuable to me and I don't want to spend it on you. Right. You know, I don't work cause we're not close enough. We're not, I don't feel that way about you. But so then like having people that are going to be in your corner who are going to be there for you for the good times, they're for you for the bad times and are willing to tell you what you need to hear and not necessarily what you want to hear. I think that goes a very long way. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Cazador, the specter of Appalachia. As mentioned during the interview, Cazador is still actively live streaming on Twitch. If you wish to view his live streams, check out the description below for links to his socials. If you enjoyed this episode of the Atomcast, the best way to show your support is by becoming a recurring Patreon member, as your contribution will go directly towards improving the quality of future episodes, decreasing the time between uploads, and will help to sustain this and other transmissions long into the future. For now, though, I once again thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you all out there in the wasteland.